Welcome to The Lair, a place where interesting people you may know tell you things you didn't. So grab a chair and your favorite vice and get comfortable. There are no rules in The Lair, but there is Laura Babcock. You know her from TV, and she is not into media monogamy. Let's find out who else is in The Lair. We're actually, we should tell people who we're in the lair with. Sure. We're, we're well. in the lair with Sandy Shaw. And Sandy, people know you in town in various roles. Yes. They know you uh, from the work that you did with the Social Planning Research Council as a researcher over the years. We worked together years ago That's in right. capacity there. Uh, they also know you from the chair of the board of the First Ontario Credit Union. Uh, and as somebody who espouses, is it fair to say, the NDP values? Sure. That's fair to say. Yeah. Uh, so you're an act activist. Is that going too far? Yeah, I, I'd say I'm kind of a lazy activist. A lazy I, activist. <laughs> the activist sounds way busier than I am. <laughs> sure, I you know what I like to you know speak out on things that are of a passion to be concerned to me. So if that makes it an activist, sure, I would say. That. I think given you know all the protests, we just talked about all these protests. Yeah, we had you know, I'm not, Trianney yeah, here earlier. I'm not like walking up and down the street with a placard. Let that let's just say that. So but. an activist, a lazy activist, is one who advocates their views but doesn't bother to show up in March. Doesn't march, but definitely makes some phone calls, sends See? a whole bunch of emails. See, that's, shows so that's up more at than the, most people. So, yeah. so you're, you're a tech savvy activist. That's you're right. You're an activist of the new millennium. you got to show up at the right committee meetings at the right time. And, right. You know, so, 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 that's a smart activist. Exactly. That's right. So, you know, um, there are rules for everybody. Um, right. But if you have access and influence and connections... Why go out and march? Exactly. Let other people march and make the phone calls. Well, you know what? That's exactly that's my strength. I think my strength is that you just figure out what are the rules and what is the system and how can you work that in your favor, really. Mm -hmm. So Interesting. that's kind of because, because um, some people would suggest that the system need, is broken or they want to work around the system, but what you're saying is that, and I've heard this argument many times, that if you want to affect real change, you have to work within the system to get it, to be outside and just protesting. Everyone has, a, I think there's many tools and many ways to get at, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And I do believe that, you know, marching, honestly, I do think that marching and the way people need to express themselves is interesting. We talk about mm -hmm. people being interesting and having passion. Uh, but I also think there's uh, other skills that you can put to mm -hmm. play and, and just, uh, you know, just, uh, it's like Tai Chi. I don't know, it sounds kind of silly, but Tai Chi, you, what, what it's all about is a defense. What you do is you take someone's energy and you work, you use it against mm -hmm. them, and it's sort of the same thing. If you just find out wh what is the system and understand that, you can bring that energy and work it in your favor. And so that's how I, I sort of like to approach it. So, what are the issues that you're passionate enough to go all Tai Chi on? Well, I oh, I like to go all Tai. Well, really, um, really. At, uh, Fundamentally, I'm really concerned with equity, social justice, those kinds of things. They're really those profound things when you were young that really annoyed you, that made you mad. I mean, when I was a kid, very young, things used to, injustices particularly, just used to really, uh, you know, really um, upset me. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, if I really look at a sort of a theme for my life, it's just being what, what can I do in, in my own small way to uh, correct any kind of sort of what I perceive as, a, as an injustice. Hmm. It's a pretty big, pretty big umbrella, but you just chip away at it in whatever way you can. Well, what, right? what do you think? Was there a pivotal moment as a child? Was there a tipping point in your life? Is there something that made you say, this is the, la this is the last time I'm going to watch this without actively trying to write it? Well, I don't know. I, if I could, I'm not exactly answering your question, but I have a story that my uh, grandfather told me. It sounds like, mm. a, sounds like, a, <laughs> like I'm on a front porch telling you a story, but honestly, my well, grandfather... Sorry, the Lair's kind of porch. Yeah. We're, we're <laughs> drinking. We're in well, reclined chairs. <laughs> my grandfather was from Scotland, my family, and they were, they were activists, as you would call them, in Scotland during, you know, during the, before the, the Second World War and during the Second World War. And uh, my dad tells a story during the Second World War um, that in Glasgow they had captured uh, some German soldiers, they were prisoner of war, and they were marching the soldiers through downtown Glasgow, and people were lined up and they were uh, jeering these young soldiers and throwing things at them because they were German, and my uh, dad tells a story now that he realizes now how just, how just very young, these were just young boys, German boys of 18, 19, and my grandfather, who was my father's father, obviously, mm -hmm. gave him what he says, he gave him a, a wee bit of sweetie, a little bit of chocolate to give to him. And he gave it to my father and told him to give it to the boy. So my father ran up as a little boy to this German soldier and gave him this little piece of chocolate. Mm -hmm. And my dad to this day remembers, you know, this young boy looking at him and smiling at him. So that honestly brings tears to my eyes telling that story. So that, to me, that's the fundamental kind of humanity that you have to have in whatever it is you, you choose to do. And so, um, you know, not really asking, answering your question, but... It's a great story. Yeah. 
But I've done a lot of work around, you know, in poverty issues, equity so for to, women. So just to break down that story, what is it that makes you cry about that? I think it's that we, we uh, don't see everyone's humanity. I, I think we have, uh, you know, we have a unique opportunity, uh, you know, in life to connect with people, mm -hmm. really to understand people, to connect with people. And Marie was, Marie Bertrani was yeah. here earlier talking yeah. about everyone, you know, has something to, to give. And I truly believe that, that, uh, that I think that we miss so much when we don't connect with each other's humanity. And that it's in many ways, it's, it's us that benefits from that. If we, if we are able to really uh, take, really to reach out. And I think maybe this sounds like Pollyanna and naive, but I think if we did more of that, we would have some, some of the less, of the, the kinds of uh, inhumanity we see, some of the awful things that we hear and the, the way people treat one another. You know, right. on that note, I was listening to an interview the other day with somebody who had come out of a torture environment in another country. And uh, he had been playing in his mind Leonard Cohen's music. Yes. And uh, the interviewer, I believe it was Gian Gomeshi, I could be mistaken, said, you know, why Leonard Cohen? And he said, well, because he didn't know Leonard Cohen. He didn't know those words, and he didn't know what was running in my mind. He couldn't take that away from right. me. And, and so they, they got on talking about how he handled it. And he said, I, I think the interviewer mentioned something about monstrous acts or a monster. And he said, you know, I would not let my torturer be a monster, because if he was a monster, then, you know, there was no way I could connect with him. That's right. Um, so I saw him as a human. And if I could see him as a human, with all of his humanity and all of his flaws, then I could find a way to, to not be so afraid, a way to um, manipulate even understanding his human traits. You know, so by keeping the person, even the worst torturer, mm -hmm. as a human being and trying to have, I mean, yes, he was using it to survive and, and even manipulate, but he was also looking at it sympathetically in a certain degree and saying, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put this into a character. I'm not going to create this person to be bigger than they are. They're a human being right. who's torturing me for whatever purpose. And that's how he survived the torture and, and came out on the other end. Exactly, and maintained his own sanity because he didn't yeah. lose his humanity as well. Yeah, that's right. It's funny you talk about music because I go to the opera. I love the opera. I don't know much about it. Sounds I just love it, and I, I don't know why. I like the grandiose of it, I like the. You know, well, it surprises me because you were married to a rock star. I point. was, yes, so. but yeah, <laughs> exactly. So there's some grandiose things that I like and others that I don't. <laughs> yeah. But I at the opera often I'm so moved because exactly this. I think sometimes when the, the, it, it's so beautiful, what 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 the opera is is so profound and beautiful, and it's such a pinnacle of what humans can do. Mm -hmm. Then I think that the opposite. I mean, how can we be these creatures that create such beauty and such love and profound, uh, you know, depth of understanding? And then we do things like torture one another. So yeah. that that uh, that is, um, you know, I don't want to sound too, too spiritual, but that dichotomy is so. Um, it's it's really hard well, to one understand. Of the, one of the things that this this uh, torture, I don't want to call him a victim because he didn't act like a victim right? in the in the in the sort of prerogative sense of what we think of as a victim attitude. He said. Um, I didn't make him an animal either, because mm -hmm. to make him an animal, animals don't torture each other. Uh, I know. They kill and eat, but yeah. they don't torture. So he said to call him an animal was, was actually, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, disparaging yeah, towards animals, yeah. right? Because right. what, what animal does that kind of stuff? Cats can be pretty mean with mice, though. I yeah, think. can they? They, 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 <laughs> they bat them around a little bit. <laughs> They're cats, so, yeah. <laughs> See, I, I, I actually am afraid of cats. I don't have a lot of fears. You, well, you probably should but be. But I'm terrified of cats. Yeah. I'm terrified they'll, of raccoons. Yes. Because they're smart. Yep. Yeah, they'll get you. And have you seen the little fingers? They're, <laughs> they're pretty yeah. scary. But you know, cats, I found out that my fear of cats, um, cats have been both the source of idol worship because they yes. are so kind of creepy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People think that they represent the underworld in good ways and bad ways, but they were also... There were cults of the cat back mm. in, I believe, ancient Egypt. There was also mass murder of cats and burials of cats. I mean, it's cats, very bizarre. Have, cats have really screwed with the human psyche yep. for a long time. <laughs> and so I don't feel quite so weird. They don't, they don't like us too much. They, they'll take from us. They're not a big fan of well, us. You know what? This documentary, I travel on the road far too much and listen to way too many documentaries. I have a lot of incidental knowledge. But one of the <laughs> things that I heard um, was that these cats uh, are the only non-domesticated animal that lives with humans. We've never been able to domesticate cats. No, exactly. They live on their own terms, they control their own environments, and we just 
Is that why a lot of people like let their cats walk around outside? And well, we have no control over them. Come they, back. they do, like they literally. They've just said we've never. There's never been a case of a domesticated cat. Mm. There are cats that decide to tolerate us and live with our comfy surroundings, but we don't domesticate them. That's great. Interesting. I agree. Eh? It is interesting. I did not know that yeah. about cats. I, I'd say the only animal that like we like and likes us back would be the dog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they like us. We like them. They like yeah. us. But yeah. all the other animals do not want having to do with us. Squirrels <laughs> are, do not like us. Yeah. <laughs> Gee, I wonder, maybe it's that whole food chain thing <laughs> <laughs> that we kill and eat them. Actually, I think I just saw something in the paper that a, a sign, this is starting to feel like an episode of the Ricky Gervais show. <laughs> we went from torture we, yeah. to cats really fast. I think with, it's with, me. I'm afraid with, it's me. <laughs> no, no, no. You know what? You're, uh, you're so interesting to talk to. That's why we can talk about so many things. Um, but, and and I, I'm not trying to suggest that Larry Cass is anything like the Ricky Gervais show because, you know, he, it, that show is God. Uh, but, um, and we have no Pilkington and I'm certainly not Gervais. But <laughs> the thing that they, they, they sort of go from subject to subject. And there was something that I saw in the paper that a Mac student has a theory that the reason why chimpanzees nest in trees is to adapt to human hunting. That they are, in fact, not a tree nesting species, they went up there because we started to hunt them on the ground, which I think is fascinating. That is fascinating. Doesn't that throw your whole perspective on that around? I think it's so they can it? fling their dung at us when we walk by. <laughs> 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 okay, she's Pilkington. <laughs> simply to get the higher position. So let me That's know when we start taping, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're a couple oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> That's okay. We'll edit the dung out, I swear. <laughs> yeah. so so they they can, like, their poop at us. I said, okay, let me throw another weird one by you since we're right. weird, weird, weird conversation. Um, I was listening to this thing about how you should never have assumptions in life. Yes. We've all heard that analogy, assumption, assume is makes an ass out of you and me if you break the words down. You're a wordy, Gabby, as we talked about earlier, and we'll get to that subject in a second. Yeah. Um, but there was, I was listening to something that says you should never assume. There was a book that was written, I think it was called Leap, it could be wrong. But there are stories of, you know, um, weird and wild and amazing things that have happened. And one of them was when the, the A-bomb was dropped on, uh, Hirosh on Hiroshima during the Second World War. They studied 75,000 children who were in their mother's wombs yeah. at the time, in utero, uh, they studied them throughout the course of their life. And what would you expect would be the, what, what would you expect they would find, given that they were... Trouble, difficulties, all yeah, sorts yeah, of things. Yeah, all those kinds of things. Right, because yeah. they were literally in the womb yes. during yeah. a nuclear fallout. What they found was they were healthier on every measure than kids who were not in utero during nuclear really? fallout. Really? Isn't that crazy? Do they know what why? What about people who were... Like, not just people. Do you know, I don't know. They did the study on in utero kids. That's so these kids, crazy. they didn't just come out non effective, they came out healthier. So did they, by all markers, propose the reason why? Any theory as to why they think that is? Other no, than just I didn't hear story? that. They didn't get into it. They just said, you know, don't assume. Like, there was actually the fallout of the nuclear yeah. fallout was positive yeah. on these babies in utero. Well, that whole assumption thing is, again, yeah. this theme a little bit is also assuming uh, what people have to offer and assuming what mm. people, what their character is about. And, and I think, you know, you were talking about the, um, you know, concern with people that are King and James and assuming what their yes, story is all yeah. about. Yeah. I mean, I, again, that, I mean, what is Let it, ask of you and me? Let me a little bit of context me? to that, and then okay, I'd love sure. your comment on it. Um, in another Laircast, we were talking to Marie Boutriani, mm -hmm. former cabinet minister, uh, and we were talking about, and she's a psychologist, and so when we got talking about psychology, I brought up a recent uh, brouhaha with uh, Larry Diani, former mayor, where he characterized the people of King and James in a way that I thought was unfair, um, describing the way they looked and saying they had to sort of be dealt with for the rest of Hamilton to succeed. I thought that it smacked of elitism and, and not the way a mayor should talk about people he used to represent. I'm friends with Larry, and I keep saying that, not because I'm trying to put a caveat on it, but because I really think he's a good person, right. and I don't think that he meant it the way it came across 100%, mm -hmm. but there was still something in it that I felt I had to take issue with. So when Marie was here, being a psychologist, being a Hamilton politician, I wanted to get her to weigh in on it, and you heard that conversation. I did, yes. I'll let her, Larry Cass, speak for herself, but what was your take on that? Well, I sort of agree with what, really, you and Marie were saying is that I mean, well, you know, we want people to feel welcomed in their neighborhood and, and to walk down the streets. We also, 
uh, don't we also need to see that life is full of the, the full breadth of what life is about? Mm -hmm. And you know, we just assume that these people are, you know, either with, I don't know what the assumption is, but we don't know their story, and we don't know, you know, really what people think have to of offer. You think we're scared I think of some people know? are. Yes, certainly. I think some people are, are scared of, you know, what we don't know. But I think that fear, you know, if you take that to its extremity, the fear shuts you off from life. You know, so if you just take it by degrees backwards, you don't know what this person's particular story is, and there. I mean, I'm not saying that you necessarily need to spend time with these people, but I think you need to understand that life is not like in a box. Things, yeah. you know, there's there's many different things. Well, like that she said, what is normal? For them and their exactly. Own and exactly. Do you think that it's that we're concerned if we engage, we're going to be clung to, or we won't have a have an exit I strategy? But I'm asking that. You very mean like candidate. actually making eye contact? Well, I mean, that's like the Marie said, like as a psychologist, she'll walk up to them, right. she'll engage them, she'll talk to them. I hear that, and I'm thinking, oh my God, I can't imagine doing that. I've got young kids, I have a business downtown, and you know, it, if they do have issues, serious mental health issues, am I engaging in something I can't it's understand? True. Sometimes, like Barton Street bus, you don't always want to make eye contact on the bus because yeah. you don't know what you have to deal with. But it's not always really that scary. I mean, I don't really think that that's scary. I was just saying, walking here on James Street North, there was a guy that was gesturing to me, and you know, a sort of a, you know guy that was not in a suit, let's put it that way. Yeah, sure. And I was at the stoplight, so I tried to understand what he was saying. And finally, what I understood what he was saying, he was pointing at the Lister Block, mm. which is this beautiful, looks so beautiful. But what he was saying is, why are the lights on? Mm. You know, top to bottom lights are on the Lister Block. So we had a point. But then I said, but it's a beautiful building, isn't it? And he said, oh, yes, it's a beautiful building. He's glad they saved it. So here's a fellow that maybe yeah. nobody, you know, would take the time, but he yeah. had an opinion about yeah. the Lister well, Block. He has a point. <laughs> Not only uh, he has a point, but I think a part of it is that people are afraid of the unknown. Absolutely. Yeah. So they don't understand. They see people on the street that they can't relate to right. and that they don't, they're scared of them. They don't know what their deal is. And I, I think a part of it is, you know, seeing that fear of, oh, shit, I don't want to end up like that. Mm -hmm. And avoiding anything to do with those negative aspects and opening yourself up to that. Well, isn't the first thing pretty much any kid learns is well, there is that, yeah. Oh, you're going to say, don't talk to strangers. You know, I'm thinking about it. There was a time in my life when I wasn't doing well, and I was hanging out with those exact, I mean, those people, I don't want to paint them with red brush. I don't know those people, but I was hanging out on the street a lot and had a lot of friends and got into a lot of situations that I shouldn't have been in and knock on wood I got out of or, God willing, got out of. Um, so it's an interesting perspective, I find, that because I knew so many people like them who spent their time downtown at lunch, who had drug problems. You know, those were my friends at one time in my life. Were you and were you married to a musician too? <laughs> so no. <laughs> 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 That's funny. No, it was not me being married to a musician with his friends. This was me not going to high school for several several years. Um, <laughs> that's funny though. <laughs> my mother-in-law, so Tom, my ex-husband Tom Wilson, his mother, Mrs. Wilson, she was a wonderful woman. She was just a great gal, a real sport, grew up during the Depression. There's, there's a whole generation of people that grew up in that era. They're just great. They're great to talk to. They share. They're easygoing. They have none of the hang-ups that we have. They don't need mm. stuff, want yeah, stuff. They're pretty true. cool. Anyway, she used to go downtown. She put her hair in a bun and stood as straight as could be and walked downtown with her collar buttoned up, and she'd always go to eat and buy chicken pies. Well, she always put in her pocket change all the time. Mm. So she had change, and she had the those are characters. We know these characters. You know, we always say, you know, the guy that used to be in no, front of Kresge's sure. that played the harmonica. Yeah. You know him. You've seen he's him. He's still there. Right? Exactly. Actually, today. These he's, are... he's in front of the, uh, the library oh. where we went for lunch. We all know these guys. Yeah. And there's the guy with the short shorts. Do you remember him yeah. for a while? He'd wear short shorts. So she knew these guys, and she would take the time to talk to them and, and hand awesome. out... Well, one time my brother-in-law was working for a newspaper and his assignment was to be a panhandler downtown mm. and to do it for a day and write about the experience. Well, she knew him, Mrs. Wilson knew him as my brother-in-law, Ed, and she was downtown and he was doing his thing, panhandling, and there she was, she saw him. So she gave him money <laughs> and kept walking and never said a thing about it. But in her mind, she thought, what is going on here? Oh, my God. <laughs> That's so cute. But there's so, an example where she didn't even judge. She went, well, he's down, he's panhandling, he needs money, we'll give him some money. But we never heard, she didn't come back and say, you know, I saw your brother-in-law yeah, downtown. And, and this is what I'm wondering in the conversation is that because 
certainly I hung out with people in similar circumstance and thought no judgment against them at the time. I was one of them. Yes. When I look at it now and my circumstances have changed, I wonder is my perspective skewed because I want to protect what I have to make your point that we don't want to because, you know, we don't want our lives to go that direction. Yeah. But at the same time, I had a visceral reaction to Larry's comments because mm -hmm. I just thought that it that there was, you know, they, there, la there was an empathy lacking there. And I don't, I'm not saying he lacks empathy, but his comments seemed to me to lack empathy because I thought, you know what, like the, I might have looked like that. My friends might have looked like that. You can't decide well, somebody's like life based on their Yeah, their well, not judging a book by its cover, right? But like, it's a good indication of what's going to be in the book. It's just not definitive. Oh, well, exactly. You know, like I think we as humans have to make superficial decisions because that's how we survive. You know, we, we use every bit of data we can get in our frame of reference. A lot of it is visual, right. and that helps us determine. But I think we're but, too easy to leave it there. Yeah, I agree. And what I mean by that is I agree. I I like clothes. I like the look of things. I like aesthetics. You like to steal from little boys, apparently. No big deal. <laughs> and so I, so I understand that to a point, but I just mean not looking at someone and defining them fundamentally of who they are by what you see. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's excellent, but how do we get past that? Because in our fast life, right, you get one shot at it, you make a quick decision, and you kind of leave it there. I, I don't, you know, I don't think we've learned that much since high school. Mm. So doesn't this sort of sound like the mean people in high school that had no time for people that sure. turned out to be, they were the freaks or however you want to describe them, but sometimes they turned out to be the most interesting people See, but and we worse, missed out on I talking was, to them. I was the freak in high school. Yeah. I was, I had the mohawk. High five, Laura. Hey, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the lair. <laughs> I recognize a fellow <laughs> high school freak. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, is that you're hilarious, Sandy. Thank you so much. In the great experiment that is the lair, you are uh, awesome to talk to. We'd love to have you back Well, again. I had a lot of fun. I had you a lot of fun. You let us talk about monkeys in trees, <laughs> That's nuclear right. fallout, That's right. rock stars, Trudeau <laughs> bath road. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. 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 That's when you have the producer's heart. When you said the monkeys strategically sit in trees to throw poop at us. No, the chimpanzees. The cursed cats. The cursed yeah. cats and, uh, and all of the above. Thanks, well, Sandy, for go. being in the lair. Well, it's been great. Thank you. <laughs> Chats in the Lair is a Power Group production. Visit us at powergroup.ca or laircast.com. Or check us out on Facebook and follow us on Twitter.